Netherlands versus France ends in an entertaining goalless draw. Before we start, to all my Kenyans, the revolution shall be televised. Guys, finance bill, time for you to step up. Step up. As Kenyans, we need to step up. As the youth, we need to step up. And yeah, don't forget, just do something. Do something. Go outside. Go protest. Go talk about it. Retweet. Just do something. Don't stay still. Don't stand still. This one matters. So yeah, Netherlands, France, 1-1. Uh, one, one. Uh, sorry, nil, 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 nil. Sorry, there have been so many one ones. Uh, like that's just the default scoreline I'm doing for everything. Um, in fact, yesterday I did every, everything was one one, and to the point where I was, I had to redo. I think the la- what was the last game yesterday that we did? Um, it was a live that we did. I'm forgetting which game it was. I had to do it like three times because I kept on saying nil uh, one one instead of um, one nil or two one or whatever the scoreline was. As my voice disappears. So yeah, anyway, Netherlands took on France. Um, uh, the game was... Uh, it was entertaining. I will say it's entertaining. The refs had to get involved. Again, every time English referees are involved. Like, for this one, to be honest, I understand why they didn't give the decision. So I won't fault them. But it just so happens that it, it just had to be when Anthony Taylor was refing. When it was the English contingent refing that all these things pop up again. But I think they got the right decision. I just feel like it took way too long to get to this decision. You have automated offside. Well, it was pretty obvious he was offside. But all you're looking at is that you only did one angle to know that the ref, the angle behind the post, that the keeper could not get to the ball. And the ref should have made like a very quick decision there. I feel like we wasted way too much time at that decision. Um... And there's this one, I think there's the Michael Oliver game as well. So, yeah, the English referees are not... um, I'm not saying they're bad. They're not performing badly. But it just so happens that their games are eventful. Let's say that. Their games are eventful. Um, But to be fair to them, the right decision, they got the right decision. It just took out way too long. I think we've we've had so many quick decisions in this tournament. It's funny because when you come from the Premier League, you're like, wow, these decisions are so fast. You're not used to it. After 16 games, 18 games, whatever it is, now we're so used to quick decisions that when they're not happening quickly, we're like, yo, why are these decisions taking so long? Um, yeah, human nature. But yeah, I was quite fascinated by how France set up um, and how Netherlands countered that by using pace on the wing. So what Netherlands did to France today is what France do to every other team. France always have Mbappe there on the right. And that forces your defense. You have to have someone quick on that side. You have to have someone agile and nimble. And you have to have a defensive midfielder who's ready to cover. Supposing that guy is beat, right? Netherlands did the exact same thing France did to every team with Frimpong. Frimpong, he, like in the first few minutes of the game, he had a chance. He literally, in the first minute, the ball, he was through on goal. Um, I, I don't know how they lost the ball. Saliba was trying to then try to tackle, couldn't get the ball. Then he went to Frimpong. Theo did so well to chase back and just distract him a bit and win the corner. Um, and concede the corner, rather. Win the corner for the Netherlands. And that was like the first moment, which was like, yo, warning signs. And I think what that did is that it really um, told them, yo, you can't joke around. Like, you can... They have, they have shown what they want to do for the rest of the game. And to be fair to Didier Deschamps, um, he, sent, he said to send Kante to that side. And it's like, Kante, you just just be aware. The next like three or four times he got the ball, there was at least three people around him, and one of them is Conte, another one is Saliba. Like b- probably two of the best one-on-one defenders we've seen. Well, for Saliba, best one defender we've seen in the Premier League the last season. And Kante, one of the best one of one-on-one players defending one-on-ones, right? So yeah, that was that was solid from them. I feel like Chuamini in midfield, he was okay. He wasn't that great, but second half he was much better. Because the thing is, you have to drive forward in midfield. Like, when Mbappe is not there, you have to move. You guys have to start attacking those spaces. He Mbappe has so much gravity. He reminds me of Steph Curry. The moment Steph Curry crosses the halfway line, you have to start thinking, how are we defending this guy? You know, he can just three from anywhere. I'm going to use a lot of sports analogies. Case I realized one of my biggest strengths is that I watch many sports. And if I can use a reference from somewhere else and show you in football, um, I guess I can enlighten you about other sports but at the same time it's just it's just dope to know that you can use other sports and i'm sure many of you guys can relate anyway all of you guys are really smart sports fans so yeah 
the moment Griezmann, uh, the moment Mbappe gets the ball, you're thinking how am I sending two or three people? And uh, when he's not there, you have to do it now as a team. You have to do it as a unit. I thought that um, the lack of Mbappe would have meant a lot of, um, what's this guy's name? Marcus Turam running in behind the defense, but he really didn't get to do that. Van Dijk again. You know, the thing about Van Dijk is you never see him do those crazy one-on-one tackles or whatever. But the fact that there is there's no drama <laughs> when he's defending, like there are no those those moments of like oh being caught off guard, like a striker running behind them and the ball being kicked over, like the defense and those things don't happen when Van Dijk is there. And those are just some of the things that people I feel like we are really so hell bent on oh how many defensive actions did he do how many tackles did he have how many interceptions did he have but sometimes when you defend without drama it just shows how good of a defender you are maldini averaged 0.5 tackles per game in his career per game which means every two games he only made one tackle every two games and this is a center back no drama defending is just like that that it is just a different level and no stat will ever show you that right like Okay, certain stats like that I've just told you. But it just shows you how smart this guy is. In as much as we all want to hate on him or and all of those things, he is he's 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 a really good um solid defender. And especially in tournaments like this, where you know most of these teams don't play together the whole year. You see, like Man City, yes, and all those people play together the whole year. So the chemistry is so high. If you really want to expose a flow in you, we we need to do it as a team. And it's something we've practiced on. When you have someone who's just a generally a good player, they can really shine in these tournaments because most teams don't have that luxury of oh, training together, having chemistry and all of that. Most of these teams, to be honest, are just playing on vibes. There's no chemistry among certain people unless they play for the same team. Um, but then also, good players will always find a way to find each other, right? Good players will always play well together. So that's another thing you realize. So regardless of which team it is, Albania, whoever, that guy is the best of the best in the country, you know, so they'll definitely play well together. Anyway, enough of the philosophies. Yeah, Frimpong was really, really good on that wing, really gave them problems. I feel like the, the tactical changes both managers were making were um, really just beautiful. Like, I'll give an example. Rabio really kept on changing positions. At times, you find him use like the left winger. Then he'd switch with Teo Hernandez. Then he drops in and then Teo goes wide. And then they switch again. Marcus Turam goes there and like... They really, really enjoyed that left side. Griezmann, his movement down the middle. And uh, Kuman countered, because Kuman knows his biggest strength is Van Dijk and in his midfield. So when he brings in Gigi Wijnaldum, uh, first of all, Schutten and Reinders. Reinders to me is... That, like, athleticism is on a different level and he's just a smart footballer. So he knows the strength is in his midfield. And when Varman came on, they were like, okay, now, now we're going to hit you with something different. Because Roman is very good on set pieces. He's also someone who covers every single blade of grass on the field, which is just at, like everyone on that team, right? That entire midfield. Schutten, Varman, uh, Reinders. Um, the only person who's getting there in age, up there in age, is Wijnaldum. So when he comes on, it's more of a specialist role. You need to do this, right? Um, today, I thought Memphis was also a bit disappointing. Um, his set pieces were pff, not that great. He, he was just average, leading the line. If this team had someone, like a little Van Persie type of player, Memphis did what he needed to do. Like, that was the game plan. I get it. And that's what you have up front. So you have to work with what you have. Um, I just feel like there's a level of clinicality, if that's a word, like being clinical in front of goal that they lack. And Memphis complements that type of player, whoever that player is. But he can't be that player. Um, but he, he has to do a job up front for his national team, so I get it, you know. Um, it's not like they have many options. Vegas came on and just started hitting heads without the back, like just a physical player. Everything that he does is just like, not not fouling, he's physical. Like he's a, he's a very good player to bring off the bench, especially in the die embers of the game. Um, I thought Upamecano was really good today as well. Uh, his, com- his combo with Saliba at the back, uh, Upamecano was really getting into those last ditch tackles. Um, Saliba, it's been interesting seeing him play on the left side of defense, which we have, I'd never seen him before. That's because he has also never played there for Arsenal. I guess maybe for Monaco and whatever he might have on rare occasions. But um, yeah, he's doing okay. He's, he's still not getting those angles right because you know when you're coming, you're used to playing a right center back and then all of a sudden you switch to left like 
there's a way you attack defenders there's a way defenders attack you your your the way you play your shape your body is also different so those are just things that he's going to get used to playing on that side um but regardless he's doing a solid job on that side um dembele to me as well disappointing like to me he was the most disappointing player today i expected him to be the one to really really stand out with the absence of mbappe um griezmann was getting into very interesting positions griezmann was yeah yeah <laughs> like you can just tell that's a smart footballer you know like he just knows where to go he knows when to go he was he was quite aggressive like i really enjoyed it um yeah i guess this this game was more of a chess match it's one of those things that if you love coaching if you love watching uh two managers really go at it with great players this was it but um the result now means uh both teams are now on four points um austria obviously beat poland uh poland are more or less out because even if they get three points they can't go above austria because austria beat them head to head and yeah they might be the first team out of the of the euros if i'm not wrong um now austria france so netherlands play poland next and then france play no sorry Netherlands play Austria next and then France play Poland. Um yeah, hopefully Mbappe will be back. Um yeah, Mbappe sat on the bench the entire time even if they said he had a mask on and all of those things. I just feel like yeah, it's a bit too soon to just risk him. I'm sure he was advised to like keep, just let him don't even bring him on. Just give him like seven days at least. The thing with the nose injury is that you can if it's hit when it's too soon it can really really cause you problems but yeah give it a few more days rest he'll be fine um you can you can even come on as a sub but at that point i feel like poland the way poland are playing this team can put a few past poland so yeah no need to rush him back but yeah that was a very interesting game netherlands versus france nil nil shout out to everyone who was there on um tiktok live shout out to masimola from south africa who just we had such a good time um we taught him swahili he taught us a lot of things about pretoria <laughs> um who else and uh, there was someone else from zambia i forget his name but yeah shout out to everyone man like you guys are great 2000 people showed up on tiktok live ah so dope so yeah that is it for the last day of uh, the last game of day 7 day 8 of the euros Tomorrow we're doing a live we are watching Takiye Takiye versus Portugal and we will be live so make sure you tune in peace